On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow within him. John seven thirty seven. John six thirty five says, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. The most important information you'll read in this book and in any other book concerning success and fulfillment in marriage is found in this chapter. Sound pretty sure of myself, do I? Well, you be the judge of whether I'm right or wrong. Just do me and yourself a favor. If you don't read anything else or remember anything else in the book, please read and remember the information in this chapter. Let me begin by asking you a question. I want you to think about your answer and to be honest. Who meets your deepest needs? In other words, on a daily basis, on whom do you rely the most and to whom do you go first to get your deepest needs met? Before you answer, let me define deepest needs and give you a list of the most common sources for the meeting of those needs. Then it'll, it'll be easier for you to understand what I want you to see. Although each person has a particular area of desire or certain preferences that are important to him or her and may not be to someone else, all of us have certain needs in common. Those common needs are your deepest needs. I'm not talking about physical needs such as food, oxygen, or sleep. Rather, I'm talking about needs that transcend the physical, going deep into one's heart and soul. Each person's craving for those things is every bit as real as the built-in appetite for food. The four basic needs that all human beings are instinctively motivated to satisfy all of their lives are 1. Acceptance. Knowing you're loved and needed by others. Number two, identity, knowing you're individually significant and special. Three, security, knowing you're well protected and provided for. Four is purpose, knowing you have a reason for living. In the case of Christians, this means knowing that God has a special plan for your life. Whether you've consciously realized it or not, these needs have been motivating you throughout your life. All of us are driven in some significant way to find an avenue in life to satisfy these needs. We're as strongly driven emotionally to satisfy them as we are to find the right food for our stomachs when we are hungry. These needs are deep needs, not wants. Now, let me give you the list of the most common resources people seek for the fulfillment of their deepest needs, although these are not in the same order for everyone. Ourselves, spouses, friends, children, employers or work, churches and pastors, parents, God, money, or material possessions, or a combination of two or more of the above. After you've read this list of 10 carefully and thought seriously about these things, try to answer honestly the question I asked earlier. Who exactly meets your deepest needs? In your everyday life, whom or what do you seek first and most to fulfill your needs for acceptance, identity, security, and purpose? You may have realized that the correct answer is something like, I seek God first and more than anyone else or anything to meet my deepest needs. The fact is that most people cannot honestly give that answer, and that is the root of their problems. The reason for this is simple. Most people never come to Jesus to get their deepest needs met, so they never find what they so desperately seek in life or marriage. The scriptures at the beginning of this chapter tell us that Jesus has the ability to give us spiritual drink and food to satisfy our inner longings. He invites us to come to him for true fulfillment. He promises us complete satisfaction if we do that. As a matter of fact, when God created humans in his image, he built in a Jesus-sized hole from which all of these deepest needs stem. Because of that, no human being or anything else on earth can satisfy those needs but Jesus. Those needs were designed to draw you to the one whom God intended to fulfill you as a person. Unfortunately, most people choose to seek inner satisfaction through a quicker and surer method, quote unquote. They get married and expect their spouses to do for them what only Jesus can do. Or perhaps children have grown up being trained to look to their parents for everything. Sometimes teenagers, especially girls, deliberately have babies, thinking that they then will have someone to love them. Others move from job to job or place to place, seeking possible fulfillment. But these are only diversions.
They never satisfy. The most powerful scriptural text to illustrate this truth is in the fourth chapter of John's Gospel. It's here that the Apostle John chronicles the story of Jesus going out of his way to visit a Samaritan woman at the well. This story is remarkable for several reasons. First of all, Jews hated the Samaritans and considered them half-breeds. Second, women were considered property, and men did not relate to women with care as equals. But also, the Samaritan woman at the well had been married five times and was then living with a man outside of wedlock. She was at the well alone because she was an outcast in her community and no respectful woman would even be seen with her. In other words, she was a five-time loser in marriage who'd given up and was living in sin. Jesus knew all of that when he approached her, and the reason for his encounter with her was to heal the root issue of why she failed in marriage and lost hope. Listen carefully to the record of his exchange with her and remember the point of this chapter. Only Jesus can meet our deepest needs. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, or noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting blessing. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw any more. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband, and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said, You have well said I have no husband, for you have had five, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. Jesus chose the perfect setting to teach the Samaritan woman and all of us about the issue of soul thirst. Even though the woman at the well thought the issue was physical water, she soon found that Jesus was talking about a different type of water that forever quenches your thirst on the inside. You see, all of us are soul thirsty, and people can't satisfy much of that thirst. Only God can. The Samaritan woman make, made a mistake many of us make. She tried to get men to satisfy her soul thirst. And when they couldn't, she rejected them, thinking there must have been something wrong with them. Finally, after five failed marriages and a broken heart, she gave up. Surely, marriage just wasn't for her, or so she thought. But that was a lie. And Jesus helped her recognize that the problem wasn't with the men in her past, or even herself. The problem was that she was turning to the wrong source to get her deepest needs met. And Jesus squarely addressed the issue in verse 13. Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water I will give him will never thirst. But the water I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting blessing. The first thing you need to understand in order for your marriage to work is this simple truth. No human being can meet your deepest needs. Only God can. Of course, if you're operating in God's will, you can find someone who will encourage you or who will be God's vessel to help you experience love in a real way. However, even the most spiritual person on earth is very mortal and therefore quite limited. When you put too much hope in a person, you're headed for disappointment and sometimes even disaster. Many marriages end in disillusionment or even worse, divorce. This is because the parties involved enter the relationship with unrealistic expectations, not because they're evil or even irresponsible. Each expects the other to meet his or her deepest needs. When they realize this isn't happening, the real trouble begins, just as the Samaritan woman experienced five times. Whenever a Christian does not allow God to meet his or her deepest needs, that person automatically transfers the expectation for fulfillment to the person or the people closest to them. 
for most people, that person is their spouse. When the expectation of having deep needs met is transferred to anyone or anything other than God, three main problems are created. One, you'll always be disappointed with the results, no matter how well things go. Two, you'll lack the inner resources you need to love others the way you should and to confront life successfully. Three, you will eventually be hurt and offended by the one in whom you've invested your trust because that one cannot possibly meet your deepest needs. Sometimes the reaction to these problems is an underlying frustration that it's manageable. More often, it's an outward anger that's destructive. God's word tells us we can expect if we fall into the trap of trusting or any, anyone or anything but him to satisfy those needs he placed within us to point us to him. Proverbs 28, 26. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. Jeremiah 17, 5. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength. Compare those warnings with the promises made to those who trust in God. Jeremiah 17, 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is in the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by their water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes. But its leaves will be green, and it will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. Or Psalm 125. Those who trust in the Lord are as Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. In distinguishing among trusting in people, things, or God to meet our deepest needs, there are some insurmountable differences. The contrasts are very clear and unmistakable. Results of trusting people, things, or God. When you trust in people or things, your inner security is dependent on someone or something you can't predict or control and whose resources to meet your needs are limited. Your ability to give is dependent upon your ability to get from others. Your life is filled with an atmosphere of disappointment and frustration. Your unrealistic expectations of others create a negative atmosphere of tension in your new relationships, if not a compelling force field of pressure that drives other people away from you. When you trust in God, these are the results. Your inner security and strength are dependent upon him who is totally faithful and who has unlimited resources. Your ability to give flows from an inner resource available to you at all times, the Holy Spirit. When others are not giving to you, you can still love them generously, thus endearing yourself to them and strengthening those relationships. Your life will be filled with an atmosphere of blessing, satisfaction, and optimism. Your realistic expectations of others draw you closer together with them as you love and give to them of yourself. When I married Karen, I did not realize I was expecting things of her that only God could do for me, but I was doing exactly that. She also expected me to give beyond my ability. The beginning of God's being able to help our healing marriage came when we both realized that only Jesus was capable of meeting our deepest needs. We repented to God and to each other for the sin of rejecting him as our greatest resource and for placing unrealistic expectations on one another. The result was a transformed marriage generated in the lives of two people plugged into the life-giving power of Jesus. Since that crossroads evening I mentioned, we found that although the, P the Bible was written years ago, its words are still true because they were inspired by a living God who doesn't change or die. When you come to Jesus for a drink of water or a piece of bread, he truly will satisfy you just as the Bible says. Your entire life will change as a result of trusting Jesus daily to meet all your needs, the small ones as well as the deep ones. Jesus loves you and he's the best friend you'll ever have. Even as you read this, he's with you, ready to give eternal spiritual bread and water to satisfy your hungry soul. As you pray and read the word of God daily, you will experience the reality of his presence in your life. If you will transfer your expectations to Jesus, you'll not be disappointed because he is faithful. He loves you more than you love yourself or anyone else. He wants to meet your needs more than you want them met. There is not a detail of your life he doesn't know, yet he still loves you. For the sake of your life and the lives of those around you, trust Jesus to meet your needs. Only a person who trusts in him to do this depth can truly have a successful marriage. Once Jesus is working in your life, then everything else can work. When Jesus is not with you, success is impossible. Have you become disillusioned with life in general or with your spouse in particular? Are you regularly disappointed because you don't experience inner joy and fulfillment? 
Have you reached the point where you wonder if your marriage can ever work again? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you've been looking to someone besides Jesus to meet your needs. When you're ready to admit your mistake and come to him, he's ready to pour out his love and grace in your life. The source of fulfillment of our deepest needs is the most important factor in marriage. I hope you've made the decision to let Jesus be your rock and your source and allow God to cultivate your heart and build your marriage upon his word.